Thank you in Hebrews chapter 4, it is our custom here at Harvest. We love to go through the Bible, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse, verse by verse. We are currently in the book of Hebrews chapter 4. Who wrote the book of Hebrews? God did. Well, who was the human? Don't know, but I'll bet it was the Apostle Paul. But whoever it is, this writer is speaking to Jewish believers in Israel, uh, Jewish believers in Jesus Christ. They love the Lord, but remember, they're, they grew up Jewish. And so the, they're being pulled back to the law of Moses, to the temple, to the fondly remembered feasts and festivals, rites and rituals they grew up with. Chapter 4, we're going to see, you're going to use two powerful and familiar icons. The first and most of the section we'll look at today is going to be about the promised land. Remember Joshua? Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, Jericho. And Dan Roberts could finish that whole song because he knows it that well. Promised land. You mean Moses and Joshua? Yep. And the high priest. Let's check it out. Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since a promise remains, in other words, there's more to come. Since a promise remains of entering his rest. Now what that means is this is a reference to the promised land. It was kind of a colloquial term of the Jews with Moses and later with Joshua. The rest of the Lord. They look across the Jordan River there at Kadesh Barnea. Wait a minute. There's a great big fortress of Jericho there. Lord, you promised a land flowing with milk and honey and Starbucks. That's what you promised. Why are we looking at giants who are only grasshoppers in their eyes? And Jerichos. We talked about last week, that's a design of the Lord. What do you mean? Doesn't it seem counterintuitive? Here's your peace. And then he sits a great big giant or a Jericho right in front of you. Now go get that peace. And you're all, what about the giant? What about the high walls of that fortress? I will never get through. I just know it. I don't have it. It freaked out the first group under Moses so much that they said, we're not going. God says, you're going to have to die in the wilderness. And then we're in the book of Deuteronomy on Wednesday night. And now we are seeing that Moses is going to get the car keys. He's going to hand the car keys off to Joshua. But then he's going to go over everything again. And then that second group, they're looking. Yeah, our fathers, why did they die in the wilderness? Because they didn't believe that God had allowed giants and Jerichos. And the rest is right here. We're not supposed, when we have giants and Jerichos, try not to freak out. Because what's he doing? He set that giant or Jericho right there so that you would let go of the steering wheel. Let him do the driving and watch that giant whoosh, go down. Watch that Jericho walls crumble because you were, what, working, enslaving, and had a great, what, bachelor's degree or whatever. Why did that Jericho, why did those Jericho's wall fall? Because what were the people actually doing? They were singing worship praise. It's a funny thing about the Lord. Here's your rest. And you're like, I see it. How do I get there? Because you're often looking around a giant. It's a classic thing that God does. That when you let go and let God, sorry for the bumper sticker. Let go, let God worship and trust him. You will have peace. New Testament example, there's uh, Peter, or pardon me, there is the Apostle Paul, and he's in Philippi, you know the story. Lady comes up, and you got to listen to these guys, because they're talking from the real God, and Paul kind of looks at them sideways, this gal, for a couple days, and then his spiritual gift of discernment of spirits tells him, yeah, that's supernatural knowledge coming out of this lady, but it's not from the guys in the white hats, it's the guys in the black hats. He cast a demon out of that lady, and then we, you know, we have a wonderful deliverance. Isn't that awesome? Well, who did she work for? Her clairvoyance, but which was supernaturally inspired, um, was making these guys money. And whenever God hits anybody in the wallet, you're usually going to see them squeak. They go after Paul, and they beat the stew out of him, and they cane him. 
and then they throw him into the innermost jail up there at Philippi. You know the story. Then about midnight, now think with me if you will, what's the inner prison? Well, they didn't have plumbing, so they did what they could do to slope the floor to a hole in the middle. They didn't have porta potties, so people went where they went, and then they refused, would uh, drain, is that the right term? To the next floor that also had a similar hole. Well, good enough if you're on one of these upper floors. The inner prison, inner circle, or I should say the inner deepest part, did not have a hole at all. And that's where all that stuff accumulated. And that's where the Apostle Paul was. Lips, swollen cheeks, swollen, beaten, stinging lacerations across his back and legs. And about midnight if you will, figuratively, the darkest time of the day, Paul did what? He complained and wrote a strongly worded letter to his missionary board. Who told Paul to come here? God did. He lands in Philippi, and Troas actually, then Philippi, and then within hours, practically, a few days, really, he's in this place, Physically, he's hurting. He is in the lowest prison, the inner prison, with all the stuff dripping. God, you told me to come here, and this is what I get? Does that sound like rest and promised land stuff to you? No. Did Paul, who I believe wrote this letter and is going to tell us about, about this in chapter 4, what did Paul do? He praised God. Freeze frame. Why would he do that? Because Paul knew what it was like to be content. Some of you in the room, contentment is a, an elusive sort of grasp. You've tasted it now and again, but really you're almost always, it seems, it's just out of your and then you entertain, well, if I had this, ah, then, then I'd be. And then, you know, you do that for a minute, then that turns sour. Well, then if I had this over there, Lord, why can't I find contentment? Where's my peace? Look at the Apostle Paul. Was Paul praising and worshiping because of his circumstances? No. Because of his, he had a really good day and an excellent high fiber breakfast that morning? No. Is it because people were saying, you're awesome, you know, and your accomplishments are really something. Look at your resume. Is that why he was praising God? He was praising God because he would later write, present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to the Lord. You could do this. Then you will be able to prove what is that good and perfect will of the Lord. That's what Paul did. He knew that every footfall was dedicated to the Lord. And if my foot falls, if every step of the righteous is ordained by him, then my footsteps led me here to this inner prison. That's why he was able to worship and praise. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, Lord, but today, drip. Today, drip, drip, I can't do my drip noise anymore. Today, I am exactly where God wants me to be. That's why he was able to say, praise his name. For your consideration, Harvest, this morning, why can't you find peace? Because you don't have the rest. Well, duh, where's the rest? It's the promised land. You mean under Joshua? Now watch the writer of Hebrews weave this all together. Verse 1, one more time. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, the promised land under Joshua, let us fear lest any of you who kind of want to go back from being a Christian to following the law seem to have come short of it. Hey, Jews in Jerusalem... And, and what they're basically saying, who are you talking about, dude? We're in the promised land right now. What do you mean? We're in here. 
you guys know it's an unsettling story. Yes, God did defeat the mighty Pharaoh. He parted the Red Sea, manna every morning, water from a rock, the Shekinah glowing every single night. The promised land of peace is flowing with milk and honey, right? Supernatural protection against giants and Jerichos. And God only had one stipulation. Trust me. Drop your idols. Obey my word. Hey, how did Israel do? Let's see. They had that golden calf incident. They hated Moses. Check it out. They did. They tried to kill him. Everything God gave them, they complained about. They even complained about the manna. Remember that? Now in the desert, if you think east of Sparks is a desert, you don't know what this area is. There's even less vegetative matter. There's no water. And so what God said as a rule, I'm going to let bread grow on the ground every day. And it was very nourishing. The Bible says the feet didn't swell. Doctors would know that could have been that edema is often a sign of malnutrition. The point of it is, is they were healthy. The manna was every bit of nutrition that they needed. But they got what? Tired of it. Manna? Seriously, Lord? Now, a little while in front of that is, <laughs> we don't have anything to eat. Manna, we. And then you're week four and five of manna, and you're like, manna, oi. This is where I insert my classic jokes. We're tired of banana bread. We're tired of manna, Cotty. Manna, seriously, and then they complained. That's what humans do. They complained against everything. They cried and cried, please let us go back to Egypt. It was better there. At least we had leeks and onions by the Nile. Whoa, selective memory, dude. You hated it there. It was slavery and death. Oh, and they clutched their idols even tighter. Numbers 13, as we mentioned last week, God said, I can't work with these people. So they wandered in the wilderness until that generation had died in the desert. Now, unfortunately, it's all too common even today. God so wants to deliver all of his kids from slavery and destruction. Does that sound in keeping with the character of a God that you would expect? Yeah, that's what he wants to do. Then he wants to bless them with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and self-control. That's the food of the promised land. Then, with all of that flowing in and through you, he's going to guide you, protect you so powerfully that others watching, living nearby in their destruction, they're going to see it. And they want to get free, so then they say, can I be part of your family? That's how it's supposed to work. A uh, good place to scratch in your margin here. John chapter 13, verse 35. Jesus said, by this all will know that you, Harvest family, are my disciples. Really? How? By your, I don't know, almost any measurement of what most Christians, if I do this, right? No. Here's how they're going to know you're my disciples, by how you love one another. Now, if you've been in church more than maybe 34 seconds, um, you don't have to nudge anybody, but have you noticed that all too often the non-saved know, oh, I know you're a Christian. They know them because they're gossips. They have blown up marriages. Their work ethic is weak. And most Christians, perhaps too many, are emotionally up and down. And the unsay, they see those kind of Christians and they say, there's no promised land there. That's kind of what's all being said here. There's more to come. Verse two, <laughs> we're cooking now. For indeed the gospel, how to get saved and delivered, was preached to us all, as, to preach to us as well as to them. But the word which they have heard did not profit them. They didn't listen to what God said. Did that first generation even experience the land flowing with fruit, milk, and honey? Nope. Not being mixed with faith in those who did, who did hear it. In other words, Joshua and Caleb, they believed it. Giants, no problem. They'll be our bread. 
God said he's going to wipe them out, so we're good. Only Joshua and Caleb arrived at that. Everybody else took the fear pill that was given out by the other ten. Nobody listened to Joshua and Caleb either. The writer is saying this. It wasn't their weakness that kept God's people from entering the promised land of peace. It's because they trusted their feelings and their circumstances more than God's word. They're giants. He brought us out here to get squashed. There's Jerichos. He brought us out here to get run through by a spear. All the things that they ran into, they're giants and Jerichos. They thought God wanted to kill them with it. Being a grasshopper, I stole this, by the way. We're grasshoppers in their eyes. And somebody said, being a grasshopper does not bug God. See what I did there, Mike? <laughs> bug God, get it, what? With all, we are all grasshoppers. None of us can truly defeat sin, depression, addictions, Marital challenges. I know because I've tried and you've tried. You've tried all kind of number to address any of these giants and Jerichos, but to no advance. Where's the rest? Where's the peace? We all need a giant killer and we all need a Jericho buster. How many of you need a Jericho buster in your life right now? That only happens when we seek an unswerving knowledge of Jesus Christ and his word. It's one thing to know God's word. It's another thing to do it. Do his word over my feelings, over my circumstances. The writer is saying, don't be like those in Israel who didn't enter the promised land of peace. We have to trust God and we'll see it. Verse 3. Well, what promised land are you talking about here, Mr. Writer? Verse 3, for we who have d believed do enter that rest. He's talking about a better than Joshua's promised land. What's he talking about? Salvation and eternity with God. As he, God, has said, now he's going to cite Psalm 95, verse 11. So I swore in my wrath, says God, a thousand years in front of this writing, they, those that died in the desert, they're not going to enter my rest. Although the works, in other words, God designed that promised land before the foundation of the world. God, I designed the promised land before I made earth. I put a lot of thought and planning into it, and it's just a model. It's just temporary. How much more thought and planning have I put into your eternal promised land? The Jews are saying, what? What do you mean an eternal promised land? Aren't we talking about um, Joshua's promised land? And in fact, they might have said, our rabbis teach that the Psalm 95 is about the rebuilt temple when we all got back from Babylon. And Psalm 95's rest, teach the rabbis even to this day, is the Sabbath. We have one day of rest a week, uh, their writer of the Hebrews. By the way, if you know someone who is a Jewish family and they do observe the Sabbath, um, it's pretty fun to watch. But like most sort of family dynamics, we're supposed to be at rest on the Sabbath. But mamas, how many of you mamas rest preparing the turkey dinner? How many of you mamas or chefs rest when you are doing the work for a peaceful family event. Sometimes the Sabbath is some of the most busy, hectic, stressful time for a Jewish family. Hey, Psalm 95's rest is about the Sabbath, Mr. Writer. Hello, we rest one day in seven. The writer goes on, verse four. For he, God, has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day, remember in Genesis, uh, God worked six days, and what did he do on that seventh day? He rested for the Sabbath. In this way, and then he's going to cite Genesis 2, verse 2, and God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. And again, in this place, they shall not enter my rest. That's Psalm 95, verse 11. Now, heads up, and, and you Bible students, tune in if possible. God said, take the seventh day and rest. 
and always do that and never not do it. But then God himself says, some of these people in Psalm 95, they are not going to have my rest. Does that make sense? Whoa, Lord, isn't that kind of a dichotomy? Everybody rests one day in seven. Some of y'all aren't going to get rest at all. What is God doing? Is he contradicting himself? Doesn't that sound strange to you, says the writer? If God refused his rest for some Jews, then how could Psalm 95, 11 apply to all Jews? They might be saying, go on. That's because Psalm 95 is talking about a different rest. It must be talking about a rest that is not the promised land or the Sabbath. And then the writer, let me show you what I'm talking about. Verse 6. Some in this uh, listening crowd, in this Jewish crowd, are saying, what is he talking about? Verse 6. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of this disobedience, then again he designates a certain day, a future day. Let me sort of paraphrase. God's rest, the promised land, was there for people to enter. Many of them failed to enter because of their disobedience. So then God set another rest. And you know when that rest is supposed to be? Look at your next verse. Saying in David, today. Now, look, please, and look closely. Today has a quote, close quote. Today. What are you talking about? This is Psalm 95, verses 7 through 8. Today, close quote. Meaning, pay attention to that word, you Jewish people who love Psalm 95. You've been taught all of your Jewish life that that rest in Psalm 95 is totally the promised land and the Sabbath. The writer is saying there's more because some in the promised land never saw the promised land. Pardon me. Some of that first generation never saw the, the promised land. So what's being said? Today, notice, close quote. The writer stops at the word that begins the last sentence of Psalm 95 or 7. The writer is saying this. This today, close quote, is right now. Not for the people coming back from the Babylonian exile. The writer of Hebrews is saying God's true rest is bigger than Joshua's promised land. Bigger than one day a week. Inferred. You don't have to wait for the Sabbath to find rest. Hey, Harvest, when is God's rest available to us? Today? Tomorrow? Monday, you know, when Monday starts? When you have more, what is it, month than money? What about that day? What about when you sit quietly, if not dumbfounded, in the doctor's office when they say, here's your condition? What about the day when your spouse is not behaving like you wish they would or they should? What about those days? Is that rest available then? Yes. After such a long time, 1,500 years from Joshua's promised land, as it has been said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. There's your Psalm 95, 7 and 8. Yes, Psalm 95, 7 and 8 speaks of being back in the promised land after the Babylonian exile, but that's only the near fulfillment. If nobody's ever told you, lots of prophecy in the Bible. Did you know that practically every page of the Bible can, contains some sort of speaking into the future? It's pretty cool. Whether it's model form or literally it's going to be so many days from this event to that event. Did you know that your Bible names people before they were born? Uh, check it out, Isaiah chapter 44. And your name is Cyrus. And you're like, Cyrus? What's that doing in the Bible? You do the math. Cyrus isn't going to be born for another 150 years. Yet his name is written in the Bible before whom he was born. Your Bible is full of prophecy. Now, something about prophecy you got to know. 
almost all prophecy has a near fulfillment. The Assyrians, um, the Babylonians, the Romans, etc. They have a near fulfillment. But almost all of those near fulfillments are a model of a farther fulfillment. And Psalm 95 is no exception. Psalm 95 does speak about being in the promised land after the Babylonian exile, but the writer is also prophesying a future peace, a future promised land of rest. The far fulfillment of Psalm 95, check it out, and we've got teachings on it, is actually describing the thousand-year millennial reign of, of Messiah here on the earth. And there's even a final fulfillment. What is our best rest ever? Where is it going to be uh, when we go camping? When is the ultimate rest of well done, good and faithful servant? When is that realized in heaven with the Lord? For if Joshua 1,500 years ago had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another or future day. Verse 9, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. Verse 10, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. In other words, Joshua led Israel into the promised land, but Psalm 95 is saying, God promised a rest that would come after the Joshua promised land. That means there's a promised rest that is not the Sabbath. It's not Canaan land rest. It's not creation rest. It is the rest when we put our trust and our whole life in Jesus the Christ. Does that make sense? This is a rather sort of sophisticated, if that's the right term, little description here in the book of Hebrews. Um, the writer employing Psalm 95 and Joshua and all that together, it does take a little homework, but hopefully we're sort of grasping it. Hey, do you know the promised land? Everybody knows the promised land. That's uh, the land flowing with milk and honey. Do you know that's a model? Like everything in the scriptures, it's a model. Did you know that there's another rest coming? Is what the writer is saying. The Jews are all, what rest is that? Punchline. The rest is get saved. Ask God to fill you with your Holy Spirit, with his Holy Spirit. And then what happens? You're going to have love, and joy, and peace, and patience, and kindness. Spouses, that's often what's missing in your fights. There's not kindness there. But she, but he, I know, you're right. But weren't you kind of a big fat jerk when I saved you? Uh, maybe a little, Lord. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness. I do it when I even don't feel like it. Devotions, praying, whatever it might be. Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, meekness. You know what meekness is? I have an ability to do a number of things, but I choose to do God's heart. Do I have an ability to go get crazy at bullies and throw back a bunch of beer and pizza? Do I have their freedom? Is it going to send me to hell if I'm truly born again? No. Everything is lawful for me, says the Apostle Paul, but not all things are profitable. Meekness is, you know, I have an ability to really tell my spouse what for because I can show them all the stuff they're missing. Yeah, but didn't Jesus say, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast. It keeps no record of wrongs. Yeah, I hate that one, Lord. Because boy, do I have a case against my spouse. And Jesus says, yeah, what was the case against you? I nailed it to the cross. I love that my sins are on the cross. I hate it when someone else's sins are on there too. Because I sure would like to point them out. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. 
Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking my way. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Now I put my name in there. Steve always hopes, always perseveres, never keeps records of wrongs. Steve never fails. Is that accurate? Jesus, he keeps no records of wrong. He never fails. Is that accurate? What's that in the Bible, and why do pastors read it at weddings? Love is patient, love is kind. And the two uh, blinking bride and, and beaming groom, <laughs> we are so that. Baby, I'm going to be so that for you all the time. And you give him a big old kiss. And anybody who's been married more than 27 minutes knows, <laughs> Harvest, the agape love that 1 Corinthians 13 is talking about is not capable with the humans, not on a consistent basis. You want that kind of rest and kindness, you've got to grab the hem of his garment and never, ever let go. That's what is actually being said here. Verse 8, for if Joshua 1,500 years ago had given them rest, then he would not afterwards have spoken of another or a future one. Do you know what? There remains, therefore, a rest, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from the works, from his works, and God did from his. Joshua led Israel into the promised land, but Psalm 95 is saying God promised another one. Jesus' rest and being filled with his spirit is not one day a week, it's all the time. Verse 11. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Be born again, spirit filled. Let his fruit flow. Lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Remember what they did. They refused God's word and they died in the desert. Don't be like that. Verse 12. For the word of God is living. If you, um, let me back up. Memorizing scriptures is really good. It's not easy for some. Um, this is a good one to memorize. You know God's Bible, the one you're holding in your lap? Listen to what the writer says about that book. For the word of God is living. That's your Greek word, zeo, and it means fullness. How many know there's living Breathe in, breathe out, eat and sleep and get up in the morning and then do it all over again. That's living. How many of you know that there is living to the fullest? That's the word here. The fullness of life. And powerful, that's your Greek word, inner grace, in, inner gaze, pardon me. And it means with maximum effect. How many of you want the fullness of God? That's your fruit of the Spirit. That's your agape love and, and powerful maximum effect. God's word is also sharper than any two-edged sword. It's piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow. And as a discerner, pardon me, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. How many of you have ever had a strong impression waft through your mind or your emotions? Whoa. Sometimes even goosebumps. And you wonder, was that me? Or was that God? Or was it the pizza? This is saying, you want to know what it is? If you want to know the difference between soul, which is your mind and emotions, and the Holy Spirit's inspiration, how do you know? By his Bible. Then, like now, did you know that bone marrow is a delicacy? But it was hard to get to. Today you can get bone marrow kind of in a more convenient fashion because they run it through that band saw. And they slice it in half. There you go. How was the old days of getting bone marrow out? You had to whack and smack and slice and dig. If you're a cook or a chef, you know that separating joints and going after bone marrow was really hard work. Lots of shrapnel and jagged pieces. Did you know that God's word is so sharp? 
It cuts and slices through tough bone and joints with ease. A great word picture for separating mind and emotions and God's spirit. How do I know this thought or this impression is me, soul, or is it spirit? It's got to measure up with God's word. Amen? Hold your finger here. Would you join me in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah? Jeremiah chapter 23. <coughs> here comes a rabbit trail. I want to show you a rabbit at the end of this trail. It's kind of important. Do you know that the Bible promises, prophesies really, Jeremiah 23, please. The Bible prophesies that the church birthed at the second chapter of the book of Acts, the church is going to go through seven consistent, or I should say considerable phases. The first hundred years of the church is going to be rough because the apostles are going to get picked off one by one. Finally, that's going to take you to the second church period that's going to last about 300 years. And during that time, the devil's all, well, we got to kill these Christians. We can't let them be Christians because spirit-filled Christians are doing great damage to my demonic kingdom. So God goes after the church from the outside. That's when millions of your brothers and sisters were shredded in the Colosseums. Now, how did that work for stomping out the church? The church actually grew quite strong. Does that make sense? Are you a Christian? Be careful who you say yes to. So that's when they would adopt the thing. I would draw an ark in the sand like this or the dust. If you were a believer, you would take the opposite ark and make a uh, kind of a, um, what would that be, a hieroglyph of sorts, of a fish. Because in Greek, fish is the same letters of, what is it, God's Son, Jesus, God's Son, Savior. It's an acronym. Are you a Christian? You don't just say, yes, I am. Because in those days, you could get a spear slipped between your ribs or carted off to the Colosseum. That's where the ichthus of the fish comes in. Sometimes you see it on a car or a bumper. Oh, look, there's an ichthus. Hey, they're a Christian. They had to do that in the first, pardon me, the next 300 years of the church because being a Christian was hazardous to your health. Be careful if you go to a Bible study or prayer time because if somebody spotted you, you could be accused. The evidence would be presented and you're tossed in jail or the Colosseum. To go to a prayer time or a Bible study in those days was hazardous. Who do you suppose was there at those small groups? Real Christians. Devil's all, well, that's not working. So about 400 AD afterwards, then God says, I'm going to go inside the church. And these seven church ages run their course. The last church age is the church of Laodicea. Jesus says the church is going to be most sort of prominent right before I come back in the form of the rapture. They're going to be huge. They're going to be juggernauts. They're going to be stuffed with all kinds of people that really love being there. They're going to be powerful and rich programs and ministries. And they're going to be so attractive to the non-saved people that there's going to be lots of non-saved people packing those multiple services. But there's a problem. Jesus, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And anybody that opens the door, I will come in. Wait a minute, that's the church of Laodicea. Jesus isn't in the inside, he's on the outside. And, and this huge, big church thing with worship potentially, tears flowing potentially, the camera kind of going across what you would swear is a hopping spiritual event. But there's the distinct possibility that Jesus isn't even there, so to speak. He's on the outside, and nobody notices. Fascinating. And in this church, Laodicean church age that we are in, I firmly believe that, one of the hallmarks is you're going to have people walking around saying, I'm a prophet. You're going to have people walking around saying, you want to be a prophet? I think I want to be a prophet. Easy. 
Well, how do I do that? Just step out and do stuff. God's in it. Go for it. There's all kinds of terrible examples of people thinking they're hearing God. Are you in Jeremiah chapter 23? Look at verse number 16, please. Jeremiah 23, look at verse 16. Thus says the Lord of hosts, this is Jeremiah, about 600 years before Jesus. Do not listen to the words of prophets who prophesy to you. Did you know that in Jeremiah's day, nobody listened to him? How'd you like that job? Wanted, prophet, I'll be a prophet. Uh, payment, prison, that's what you get. Um, what's going to be the fruit of my ministry after 40 years? Nothing, bagel, nobody likes you. Why? Because Jeremiah was against false prophets. And you know what the primary message of those prophets was? Peace and prosperity. And the people are all, Jeremiah, God's going to bring the Babylonians. You guys better, you know, change your idols. The other prophets, no. God wants you prosperous, healthy, and at peace. Does that sound familiar? They, these false prophets, make you worthless. They speak a vision, but it's of their own heart, not from the mouth of the Lord. I'm going to name some. There are some churches today, um, too many of them have worship leaders who are convinced that their impressions and that their leadings in some of these churches, their pastors, they're from God. Verse 17, they continually say to those who despise me, what? Wouldn't a group of people jumping up and down, impressed by the music and the thump and the potentially fog machines and colored dancing lights, aren't they there for Jesus? This is what Jeremiah is saying. Principle, those who can continually follow such false teachers and prophets may say they love God, but they truly are not interested in obeying God's word. Why? Because God's word corrects an honestly wayward heart. And you bring up God's word to them, they're like, hey, get out of my face. You're putting God in a box, whatever it might be. Get out of my face. They are furious with you when you keep bringing it up. Yeah, but that's not in the Bible. Quit putting God in a box. Proverbs 1 verse 7 says, fear the Lord is, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise the wisdom of instruction. 2 Timothy 4. Careful, in the very last days, there's going to be so many people heaping up for themselves teachers to tell them what their itching ears want to hear. Jesus promised, blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Those are not casual adjectives. Blessed are you if you hunger and thirst for righteousness. You will be filled. It's a promise. Blessed are, you, are the pure in heart. In other words, they're not ulterior motives when they worship. Blessed are the pure in heart. They will see God. And harvest, what Jeremiah is saying is, you want to know what God's revelation is? It's right here. No matter how compelling the dude is in the front of the room. Amen. Pastors and biblical shepherds are to teach the whole counsel of God. That's Acts 20, verse 27. You know what that means? Verse by verse, we would say. In Paul's day, they didn't have, you know, chapter and verse, but it means the same thing. Whole counsel, Genesis, and in Paul's day, to Malachi, verse by verse. They are to correct, rebuke, and exhort. And that's not what most temple goers were doing in Jeremiah's day and the Laodicean church of today. You're still in Jeremiah chapter, or chapter 23, look at verse 17. They, these false prophets, continually say to those who despise me, the Lord has said, you shall have peace. And to everyone who walks according to the dictates of his own heart, they're really not their church to be altered at all. They want pastor to tell them, you're doing a great job. 
They say, false prophets, no evil shall come upon you. You just keep doing what you're doing. Verse 18. Have any of these false prophets actually stood in the counsel of the Lord and has perceived and heard his word? No. In fact, which one of these false prophets have marked, honestly studied God's word and took it to heart? Uh, now with your eyes, we just scoop, uh, go down there to verse number uh, 28. Verse 28. The prophet who has a dream, let him tell the dream. And he who has a word, my word, let him speak my word, my Bible. This is Bible. This is not the impression of your heart. Somebody's got a dream. Tell us about it. Now let somebody read some Bible verses faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, says the Lord? Um, is wheat good for making stuff you can eat? Yes, eat that. What about the chaff? Do you want to eat that? No. What is better, wheat kernels or fruit or chaff? Wheat is. Here's what God's word is saying. Impressions, Holy Ghost, chill bumps is not as good as what? The Bible. Now, back to the book of Hebrews, and we will scoot quickly to the end. Verse 13, book of Hebrews, chapter 4. Does that make sense? Peace. How do I get it? Go to Jesus Christ. Get saved and born again first. Then every day, ask him to fill you with his Holy Spirit. Learn his Bible and then do it. And without even trying, you're going to have love, joy, peace, strong marriage. And you're going to be, no matter what is happening, you will have joy. Verse 13. And there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to his eyes, to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. That's a reference to Judgment Day. You can write Jeremiah, pardon me, you can write Revelation 20, verse 12. Do you know that in Revelation chapter 20, verse 12, books are opened? They are. Well, whose books? Well, your book. And open is your book, and there's everything you've ever thought as well as everything you've ever did. Everything you did not do. And why? Everybody's book, every act, every intention will be measured against God's word. Not emotions, not impressions. She made me do it. He made, they, I don't go to church because of what that knucklehead did will be the lamest excuse on Judgment Day. Why? Well, because the real motivations are going, to be expo are going to be opened up for everyone to see it, busted by God's word. I knew what I should have done on that day, but I chose not to. Come to find out, it was for completely selfish reasons. Did you know that on Judgment Day, because of these books, and because everybody's true motivation is open for all to see, that's why... Everyone descending into outer darkness will say, righteous and true are your judgments, O Lord. That's why the Bible also says that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is the Lord. That's why. By the way, hey, you born again believers, where's your book? You know what it is? You can write Psalm 103, verse 12. Psalm 103, verse 12. You know what God did with your book when you gave him your heart? He threw it as far as the east is from the west. Theoretically, what kind of a chuck is that? Verse 14. Seeing then that we have, great, have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. Remember, you Jewish believers, Stick to what you told Jesus. I give you my life. Don't take it back. Don't go back to Moses and the law, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in 
all points tested, really, tempted, tested, just like we are. Yet he never sinned. Why? Because every single time he chose God's word over his circumstances and feelings. Verse 16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Can I rephrase? Peace. Amen? Now let's all stand. Let's close our eyes. Would you, would you uh, mind closing your eyes along with me? You don't have to. I mean, we don't have ushers with binoculars spying out who doesn't do that. But I don't know about you, but I'm easily distracted. So, in fact, um, can you dim the lights a little bit for us? Steve, are you trying to create an atmosphere? No. Steve has ADD. He is easily distracted. I don't want any of you right now, the next few minutes, please, can you tune in? Oh, you mean uh, like the Sabbath? No. Rest. Oh, you mean like Joshua and that land flowing with milk and honey? Don't I have to be physically in Israel to do that? No. Rest. Husband. Wife, rest. Mom, dad, grandma, grandpa of that prodigal. Take your hands off. Yeah, but it's a giant. It's a Jericho. I know. Get your hand off. I've called you peace. Remember, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. How many of you cracked a smile a time or two when that came across your mind? Yeah, right. I have so much to do. My spouse is this, always that, never these. My job or lack thereof. My circumstance, Jericho's and giants, Lord. Why'd you let that happen? God, rest. Worship. Get back into my word before your day begins. Have you noticed that you're exhausted? God says you got the wrong yoke. You're running around, what is it? Counselors, lawyers, self-help, Bible studies, programs, small groups. But at the end of the day, the end of the week, the end of the month, I'm still exhausted. And my giant or my Jericho has not budged. What's up, Lord? God may be saying to you this morning, because you're not resting. And resting is, come into my presence. Let me fold my arms around you. Feel the strength of my word. Slaying giants of fear. Jericho's of impossibility. But God, I'm kind of a grasshopper. I know. I love grasshoppers. They don't bug me. Let me have it. Stop panicking. Get quiet. Praise and thank me for the things that I've already given you. Be satisfied with where you are today and enter into my rest. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Lord, I'm gonna pray for everyone here in this room today. 
Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit supernaturally overwhelm, that's not the right word, supernaturally overflow every heart in this room who will let you. And those who are dragging their feet, let them pick up their heels and say with every fiber of their being, every portion of their will, Lord, I'm taking my hands off. I need you, Lord, to handle this giant to move this Jericho. And today I choose love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. I'm going to smile at those giants and say simply, the Lord rebuke you. I'm going to smile at that Jericho and I'm just going to walk around it praising until the walls fall down. And I'm going to rejoice with you, Lord. When that giant in Jericho is behind me, I'm going to say, you did that, Lord, not me. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your holy name. In Jesus' name, and now we all said, amen. 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 Thank you for bringing the lights up. Thank you, guys. And uh, if you'd like some prayer, come up to the front. Hey, we'll see you on Tuesday prayer, everybody.